we're going to move into um, a, a discussion led by me of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, um, uh, which will hopefully highlight some of the things um, that Ellen referred to and um, the intent here is to try to help you uh, understand the, the, the scope and magnitude. I think she's already set this, these issues up pretty well. Um, and this is clearly going to become a significant part of regional planning as we move forward. So first, you know, how we got here. Um, a lot of folks said this legislation came together in the last 30 days of session. I kind of wish that were true because I spent the year prior to the last 30 days of session working on this issue um, in, a, in a number of different venues. But the, the reality is I think the cumulative impacts of the drought um, increasing local impacts, as we've seen in various areas of the state, some of which Ellen referred to, which are leading to significant overdraft, loss of community water systems, degradation of the quality of those systems, uh, significant subsidence rates in some areas. Um, those impacts caused a great deal of media attention that leveraged into a legislative discussion that started late last year. Um, we've seen litigation already start uh, in a couple of the places that Ellen referred to. And, um, and it became, it was fairly clear in the course of all of this that the, the current governor has had an eye on uh, groundwater management um, since he uh, reestablished his position in Sacramento. And that started to take evidence in a couple of different forms. First, the California Water Action Plan, uh, which was released in January of 2014. It included a number of uh, basic uh, objectives or components that the administration would look at. And you can see the underlying one there on the, on the page, uh, or on this, this frame, is to expand water storage and improve groundwater management. It caused a lot of people to try to figure out what that means. Um, the, the governor then uh, initiated a sustainable groundwater initiative, which was a white paper uh, that was supported by a couple of budgetary proposals and actions that included increased funding for the State Water Resources Control Board to get more involved in management uh, of groundwater, and then uh, additional funding for the Department of Water Resources to continue their role in collecting technical information. Um, that all evolved into a, uh, a legislative initiative that was offered out of uh, the, the governor's office um, late last year, early this year, where they set out some legislative concepts that were informed by um, both their California Water Action Plan and various agency input um, into some basic legislative objectives. The legislative process that, that ensued and really got moving in April, May, I guess, of this year, uh, really started last fall with uh, the development of some concept papers. First, there was a State Water Resources Control Board concept paper um, that explored the enhan enhanced role that the State Water Resources Control Board could take in um, pushing groundwater management to, to some objective of, I'll use the term sustainability, and I'll define that a little bit better later. Uh, but uh, simultaneously with that, in November of last year, the Board of Directors of the California Water Agencies, Aqua, um, initiated a groundwater task force that ultimately put together a policy paper. Um, and <coughs> concurrent with that was the efforts by the California Water Foundation um, to develop a policy paper. Those last two policy papers um, had a, a people referred to as a remarkable level of uh, Convergence. There was some agreement and some basic concepts uh, within those. Those then led into um, um, a, an effort to convert those policy papers to legislation. Um, there were a number of legislative hearings conducted, albeit uh, pretty thin, frankly, and looking back. Um, the process was moving uh, very, very quickly in, in some venues, and so the, the administration and, and the legislators brought uh, to the public some specific policy questions, asked input of the public on those specific issues, and then took the, that input back into um, further drafting sessions. Some overarching concepts that came out of the, both the Water Foundation and the Aqua paper, 
and frankly, some of these are very much directed by efforts within the Kings River um, service area. Uh, I became deeply involved in this mainly because our board of directors at KRCD in coordination with the Kings River Water Association felt that the risk was too high to let the legislature do this on their own. So um, very supportive of some basic objectives that were incorporated into these policy papers and ultimately in part in the legislation. And I emphasize in part, we didn't get everything we asked for. Um, so the concepts included a continuum of uh, management of groundwater at the local level. Remember the state boards out here rattling around thinking that they want to have an increased role in the management of groundwater. Our fear was that we would no longer have the local management authority and responsibility and that a state agency would come in and try to uh, apply a more regulatory approach. Um, there were uh, discussions about raising the bar as to what is what defines a good groundwater sustainability plan. Um, there were discussions about how do we better connect uh, the land use process with the groundwater management process. And as Helen's already referred to a pretty bold recommendation out of the Association of California Water Agencies that there be a, um, an expansion of the show me the water uh, criteria to um, uh, other users of groundwater, including ag. Um, there was an objective to point out that um, groundwater sustainability can only be achieved by two, in, by two pathways. One is reduced demand, which has significant economic harm to a valley that's dependent upon that groundwater, or we can look at enhancing our surface water supplies and achieve sustainability through that pathway. A um, lot of discussion about the roles of the state agencies and ultimately the policy papers define roles for the Department of Water Resources and a separate oversight or intervention role for the state board with some intent that those intervention points be very clearly defined. And then uh, finally, um, a, a policy objective or a concept was to recognize and respect existing surface water rights and existing private property rights to use groundwater. So the legislative package that came together earlier this year was um, initially two bills. Uh, Senator Pavley introduced Senate Bill 1168. Um, Assembly Member Roger Dickinson introduced AB 1739. The Foundation, California Water Foundation and Aqua both worked with these authors um, initially individually and then ultimately collectively in what was called the small group process where the administration came in and we tried to incorporate and negotiate um, concepts into these two bills. They ultimately were merged and then since both authors wanted to have some fingerprints on the final product, they split them back out in half and linked the two bills. In the last week of the session, now we're talking late August, um, it became pretty apparent that uh, some additional changes to the two bills were going to be necessary in order to, again, we're talking political process here, people, so that, that in order to get votes to approve the bills, to move the bills out of the legislature, um, there were uh, some additional concepts that were addressed through Senate Bill 1319. Basically, it missed the deadline for further amendments to the top two bills, and so the third bill became the vehicle to amend the first two bills, and ultimately they were all linked together um, and uh, became the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act that was passed out of the legislature the next to the last day of session in late August and then signed by the governor um, in September. So the, the, the scope of the legislation um, applies literally to every groundwater basin in the state, but there are some prioritizations that occur within the statute. First, um, any basin that is designated as high or medium priority by criteria that the legislature established in 2009 in the Comprehensive uh, Groundwater Elevation Monitoring or CASGEM program, um, those, those priorities were applied in any basin that's in high or medium priority that is also in a condition of critical overdraft um, has uh, the first obligation to meet some deadlines, and I'll talk about them, of adopting or creating first a groundwater sustainability agency and then ultimately adopting a groundwater sustainability plan. 
Um, DWR is supposed to update this cash change priority map by the beginning of next year. They've already said publicly that they don't anticipate much change to the map um, that they released last fall. Um, the, the most important thing, and I realize this is probably not a great map for you to look at, but the most important thing to recognize is San Joaquin Valley, dark orange means high priority. So virtually uh, every groundwater subbasin south of the delta uh, within the San Joaquin Valley are going to have an obligation to, um, to comply with this act at the first tier of deadlines. There are processes within the bill that allow agencies to propose boundary adjustments, recognizing that a lot of these groundwater basin boundaries were established decades ago through kind of a geopolitical process. Uh, groundwater magically stops interacting in county lines or <laughs> water district lines. Um, and so I think one of the things that we'll have to do and the Department of Water Resources has an obligation to do is to define criteria upon which local agencies can come in and propose uh, boundary adjustments. So I mentioned the formation of a GSA. The first, the first step in this process is to create a groundwater sustainability agency. And um, the legislation does not give priority to any of the existing groundwater management agencies that have been implementing groundwater management plans for the last uh, couple of decades but basically launched what the, uh, one of the staff members for Senator Pavley refers to as the food fight option, which means you all get to figure it out at the local level and accomplish the goal by January of 2017, July of 2017, um, uh, or there's, there are consequences. Um, local agencies are authorized to create uh, GSAs, and so a local agency by statute is defined as any public agency with water or land use authority. But the counties have been given a increased responsibility here in the Act by uh, being designated as the presumed GSA for areas that aren't otherwise managed by some other GSA. It gets pretty confusing to try to figure out who's on first. Um, but uh, there's also a provision within the Act that the Groundwater Sustainability Agency can be formed to cover the entire basin. Uh, the objective of the statute is that each basin be managed um, to a goal or a standard of sustainability. And yet the Act does allow multiple GSAs to be formed within a basin, provided that they demonstrate cooperation and coordination to achieve the basin level sustainability objectives. Um, this slide basically speaks to that. There are a number of options that we're already exploring within the King's Basin um, that are going to necessitate a, an ongoing dialogue with the many of you in this room um, and ultimately decide what is the right type of government structure that's appropriate. So the, I'm going to try to speed up here a little bit because I see I'm running short on time, but the, the requirements of the plans, um, these are optional <coughs> requirements uh, under the Act that allow um, groundwater management plans to establish or require a, a water budget, sustain, reach a sustainability standard. Uh, the plans have to have an interim milestone pathway so that DWR can review and assess and determine whether or not you're in compliance. Uh, measurable performance objectives and all of these build on the couple that they're built on the existing water code statutes that define what a groundwater management plan looks like. So sustainability, this is a word that um, we used a lot to coin this or frame this last fall. It's become a problematic term because it means different things to different people and therefore it's become a target for criticism. But the statute defines sustainable groundwater management as the management and use of groundwater in a way that can be maintained during a planning and implementation horizon, which is 20 to 50 years without causing undesirable results. Undesirable results are then further defined in the statute to include the things that you can see here, which include chronic lowering of groundwater levels, reduction in storage, degradation of water quality, land subsidence, surface water depletion that have adverse impact on beneficial uses. Um, it's important to recognize these are, these are not made up concepts. A lot of people believe they are, but essentially this section of the act was developed by a, a number of attorneys that 
California water agencies brought together and were supported by the California Water Foundation to some degree to look at how the courts have typically looked at when adjudicating a groundwater basin, the criteria to determine when balance has been achieved. And so undesirable results comes out of an appellate court decision. Um, our group of attorneys tried to define further what undesirable results are by including um, these criteria and then applying a significant and unreasonable standard against every one of them. It's gonna, it remains to be seen whether we can all agree on what's significant and unreasonable um, and whether or not results are in fact undesirable. And that's part of the dialogue I think that will occur going forward. So there are um, some basic tools that have been uh, granted to local groundwater sustainability agencies who adopt groundwater sustainability plans which include the ability to initiate a groundwater management fee, some of which are not subject to Prop 218, which requires landowner um, objection or approval under different structures of those fees, um, allows GSAs to conduct investigations, establish well extraction limits, well permit restrictions, well metering and reporting requirements, um, pursue groundwater management projects, and then coordinate more directly with the land use planning agencies important to recognize that how we use these tools at the local level is up to the local agencies. We can ultimately decide that we don't like extraction limits, we want to go to a fee structure. Or we can decide we don't like fee structures, um, we're going to try to find some other source of revenue to construct water supply enhancement projects. Uh, these are discretionary tools that are available for local agencies to apply. So, Moving to kind of the state roles, the Department of Water Resources has a couple of specific roles moving forward here in the near future. They have to develop rules and regulations that define how basin boundaries will be adjusted. Um, and then by June 1 of 16, uh, they have to develop rules and regulations that will identify how the sustainability plans will be reviewed and deemed compliant with the act or deemed sustainable. Um, there are um, uh, best management practice requirements that DWR has to do, um, and then there are a couple of other things that they've got to define, and, and I suspect they will take a shot at trying to further clarify what undesirable results means. Um, the um, department is being funded in part by some existing general fund commitments, uh, of course, uh, what Proposition 1 or the water bond brings in this arena could include some additional funding for implementation that's available through the department to the local GSAs. And then DWR will have to ultimately assess groundwater management plans, identify corrections that need to be made, um, or approve them, and then periodically review them. If they deem that your plan is not compliant and you fail to correct it, this creates the, the opportunity, that, that point where the State Water Resources Control Board can actually intervene. And so here, this slide points out that the, the board can intervene if the GSA is not formed or fails to adopt a compliant plan by the defined deadlines in the statute. Um, in that process, the state board has the ability to designate that area or that basin as probationary and then ultimately create an interim plan until the locals decide that they want to implement their plan. Important to recognize that the State Board's criteria for an interim plan are not the criteria for a groundwater sustainability plan. State Board can simply come in and say, we believe that your safe yield is X, and so you only get to pump X until you figure out how to manage your plan under a sustainability objective at the local level. So um, not a good alternative, frankly, to find ourselves in a place where we've been unable to reach agreement and invite the State Board to come in. <coughs> There are some uh, timelines for state board intervention. Remember I said at the beginning that we, we wanted some finite defined criteria um, that would determine when the board could come in. Uh, my objective was to push them back to the back end of this process and to some degree I think that was achieved. So they can't act until a GSA has failed to be formed by June 30th of 17 or if um, depending on what status your groundwater basin is in, medium or high priority, critical overdraft or not, you have to, uh, to adopt your groundwater sustainability plan by January of 20, 
or January of 22, um, or even January of 25. Um, there's, again, you can see here at the bottom is that there's an identified deficiency in this intervention process that locals still have the ability to cure um, before the state board steps in and initiates an interim plan. Um, I refer to all of this as, um, you know, we have our hands on the wheel at the local agency level. We can decide how long we want to steer, whether or not we want to get ourselves to a place that keeps the state board out of our business. Um, remains to be seen if that's possible. So just a couple of other key uh, points to identify, um, thinking back about those objectives. Uh, the legislation includes a statement of intent to respect overlying and other proprietary rights to groundwater. Um, states that it is not intended to affect surface water rights or groundwater rights to the extent they've been defined. Um, requires some coordination with the land use planning agencies, uh, but it's really through an exchange of information. There's not authority for a groundwater management plan to override a general plan or, or, uh, or anything that would restrict powers and, and authorities of the counties in the land use planning process. Um, two important things I think were uh, getting the state agencies, holding the state agencies accountable to the objectives of this act. And so there's a provision early in the bill that says, as the state makes decision moving forward, um, they have to consider the objectives of sustainable groundwater management as they make those decisions. This can be important in water quality regulation and establishing flow standards um, and making a lot of decisions, including perhaps enforcement of the um, volumetric pricing and volumetric measurement uh, requirements that uh, come out under um, SB 7X7 from 2009 that a lot of our local agencies are continuing to try to deal with. Um, and then DWR ultimately has to issue a report of future surface water supply reliability, which would be an interesting process to have them look at the California Water Action Plan and all of those things that were on that schedule and then determine how do they translate to more supply and to translate to uh, sustainable management of the groundwater basin. There's obviously going to be a, a significant requirement um, uh, to better engage the land use planning agencies. We've talked about that in the, the general planning, the land use decision making, the protection of prime recharge areas, um, and the coordination of actions to capture excess surface flows when they're available. So again, the, you know that new dialogue that I referred to in the opening comments. Um, finally, just to kind of talk about next steps. Um, I think that the first thing that we're doing and we continue to do pretty aggressively is initiate a, a local outreach and communication strategy to help people clearly understand what the act is and what the act isn't. There's a lot of misinformation, a lot of rhetoric out there as to what the act actually does. Um, and I think we need to really get ourselves to a common understanding of what it, what, what it, what it clearly requires of us and then work together collaboratively to decide whether or not we want to try um, to form a big groundwater sustainability agency or agencies to cover the planning area, um, adopt, develop, and implement a groundwater sustainability plan, and get ourselves on that pathway to sustainability that keeps the state out of uh, uh, an interim action. What DWR is going to do with rulemaking and regulations is going to be critical because it will define a lot of the terms and conditions that a lot of people are struggling with in the act. And then ultimately, um, I think there's already some discussion about um, two types of cleanup legis or two types of legislation next year. I've heard them refer to as number one, cleanup or technical correction, and number two, unfinished business. It's the unfinished business that I worry about. Um, you know, what are they going to do now? Um, uh, there were a lot of things that were resolved and left um, on the table. I think uh, there's some discussion about trying to clean up the adjudicatory processes that the courts use to determine acreage property rights under you know, the, the formula that Ellen referred to. Um, and there, there's real no clear direction today as to what a judge should do when he initiates an adjudicatory process and whether or not he's going to do the correlative equal per acre approach or look more at the um, kind of the way we do first in time, first in right for surface water. So there's a lot of discussion about whether or not we can put legislation together to provide
provides a clearer path to adjudication. Let me close by saying there's, there's kind of three options here, and, and status quo is not one of them. Recognize that the bill's been passed, um, and even without the passage of the bill, I think we were on a pathway in this state to either um, expanded state intervention and control of groundwater resources, um, and in many cases, in, an ad, in, a, in a way that's adverse to our local interests. Um, so that's one path, is state involvement and participation. Path number two is um, litigation. And litigation ultimately will lead to, in my opinion, adjudication. Uh, we can challenge a lot of different things, but ultimately as this, as this issue gets uh, perfected in front of a judge, I think it ultimately becomes a question of how much resource do I have to spread across, how many beneficial uses, and what do I do to allocate that restricted resource in that area. The third option we have is the pathway that the Act spells out, and that is to come together at the local level and create groundwater sustainability plans that are focused on building resource, and are focused on protecting the, the economic uh, and beneficial uses that are important to each sub-region and find that in a local balanced way to avoid path one and path two. So with that, I um, appreciate your attention. Again, I probably have time for a question or two. Um, Martin? I would agree. I mean, I think what you do is, is uh, emphasize the uncertain future that an adjudicatory process lays out for somebody who thinks that's the pathway. Um, and you know, again, I'm a policy guy. There may be some attorneys in the room that are experts on adjudicatory processes <laughs> that we could talk with. Um, I will point out, well, again, I think from my perspective, the courts have been pretty inconsistent in this area. And as I've talked to various stakeholders throughout the state in the last uh, several months, there are some who firmly believe that it's it's a flat per acre allocation of limited resource. And then there are others who believe, and the courts have, have been on both sides of this issue, that it's a first in time, first in right, show me how much you've used historically and you'll get a percentage of that moving forward. Um, so it, it's critical that we have a better understanding of how that works and, and then policy discussion about whether or not we can frame it differently through legislation. There is a, uh, a Senate hearing scheduled for November 20th in Sacramento um, that's going to initi initiate some discussion about how property rights to groundwater are defined, determined, and what are the issues that go into these processes, and I think that will be pretty informative to try to eliminate some of these things. Any other questions? the argument. Um, I, will, I will tell you from my perspective, I think there is a, a significant misunderstanding of what rights to groundwater are. Some people will tell you that your right to groundwater is to pump whatever you can use on your overlying property. Um, I would add a 
qualifier to that, so long as it's within the safe yield of the basin and doesn't harm your neighbor. Because that's how the courts have determined safe or sustainable yield. So there needs to be, first of all, a significant discussion about what is actually a groundwater right, and then a discussion of how do we allocate that, that, that right amongst the users within a basin. Uh, I, would, I would tell you that a court's going to look at it one way or another. I think a groundwater sustainability agency has the ability to explore and make decisions that are, that are protective of their local interests that the court might not perhaps feel, feel it has the authority or the need to do. But clearly, you know, an attempt to restrict a pumping right or charge a cost related to the use of that groundwater that some people are going to feel is infringing upon their property right, I think we need to have a better understanding of what that right actually is. One more question or we can move on. Okay, thank you. Um